Now, the space race is back. Several countries, including the United States, China, Russia, India and Israel, are trying to reach the moon. It's not just a quest for national glory. Scientists see the moon as a gateway, a place to build bases that could then launch missions to Mars and beyond. The moon has one indispensable resource for manned spaceflight, water. H2O can be used to make breathable air for astronauts and fuel for rockets. The largest water deposits are in the deep, icy craters at the lunar poles. At the moon's south pole alone, researchers suspect there is as much water as in Germany's largest lake. Over the next few years, an outpost is set to be built in the lunar orbit, the so-called Lunar Gateway. NASA will build it with Canada, Europe and Japan. It wants to involve the private sector more than before. The new space station will serve as a research platform and later as a base for manned flights to the moon. Its orbit should make it possible to see the far side of the moon and the South Pole and to have constant radio contact with Earth. Nights on the moon last for 14 Earth days and the temperatures drop to 160 degrees Celsius below zero. That's a major hurdle for long-term human missions. But there are craters at the South Pole with rims that are almost always in sunlight. NASA wants to build a lunar station at such a crater, the so-called Artemis Base Camp. Initially, astronauts will land in transport craft, which will also serve as their accommodation during their short stays, as they explore the surrounding terrain in vehicles. With each mission, the lunar base should become more comfortable. Spacecraft will bring the equipment and robots will build the infrastructure. Up to four astronauts will work here for up to two months at a time. The outpost will also serve as a springboard for a new mission, human voyages to Mars. Well, joining me in the studio is Josef Ashbacher. He is the Director General of the European Space Agency, ESA, and Alexander Gerst. He is a German astronaut who spent a year on the International Space Station, where he was also a mission commander. It's great to have you with us here on DW News. I'd like to start with you, Alexander. Why is it so important to go back to the moon after 50 years? Yeah, actually, uh, we don't see this going back because we're doing something new. So for us, it's a, a great step forward. We're going there not to plant a flag in the ground or just collecting some rocks, but we want to be there as scientists to stay, to understand this. Well, actually, it's an open history book uh, about the, the first few billion years of Earth history that we cannot read here anymore because we don't have the rocks anymore on Earth. They were destroyed by erosion. They're an, open out in the open on the moon if we study them we understand ourselves better also the moon is our next neighbor we we compare it as a an eighth continent that is right there out there to be explored to be understood and it's important for us because if you think about it as humans we're an island species we live on this little blue planet thinking that uh, it's always going to be there it's always going to protect us but that's not the case the dinosaurs have made that uh, experience uh, they were hit by an asteroid the same could happen to us there's space weather solar storms out there that threaten our society and we need to understand our cosmic surroundings so the moon is the first uh, like look outside of our little sphere and we we have the responsibility to understand it to uh, make sure that uh, our existence is uh, ensured so so you describe the moon as being our neighbor considering whether this might be a success if we were to build a moon base is there the possibility that we could see people living on the moon at some point yeah, I don't, I don't see that. You know, uh, the moon is, is hostile and dry. There's no atmosphere. There's, um, there's, you know, uh, nothing that 
that would get you as a human to love being there. I, I mean, I've spent a year in space and I always love to come back. That's a, it's an important thing that we learn. But uh, you could compare the moon to Antarctica, right? A uh, hundred years ago, it was not clear to people, why should we go there? It's, uh, it's expensive, it's risky, and uh, it's full of ice. But now, a hundred years later, in hindsight, we understand that we were right in going there and understanding uh, like Antarctica, not by itself, but because it delivers data to us that uh, is important for our understanding of the planet. Now there's uh, lots of research spaces, even though nobody lives in Antarctica just for fun. And the same will happen with the moon. And why is uh, Mars such a hot topic when it comes to the space race? So Mars can answer us two very, very important questions. Uh, in my opinion, the most important ones is uh, something that every one of us, you and I have asked ourselves that, are we alone in the universe? So if we go to Mars and if we find traces of life, extinct or existing, doesn't matter. If that life was, was formed independent of life on Earth, that means just by like the first view out, the first planet we look, we find life, that means the universe is full with life. Right now, before we go to Mars and find out about that, we don't know. We, we're not, we cannot be sure. Is there life out there or are we alone in the universe? The second thing is, Mars, uh, we see it behind ourselves now, is, uh, is a very dry and hostile planet. But actually, it used to be, um, it used to be full with water, it had a thick atmosphere. It used to be able to support and sustain life. Now it's dead and dry. What happened there and how can we prevent the same happening with Earth? All right, well, stick around because we do have another report coming up. One of the European Space Agency's key missions is to gather data about climate change. The information should help scientists to predict natural disasters such as hurricanes or droughts. The agency's Sentinel satellite system flies over the same region every few days, acquiring information over time. Well, researchers can then see how land, sea and air are gradually changing. Well, let's uh, turn now to Joseph Aschbacher, who is the Director General of the European Space uh, Agency, the ESA. How could this new satellite system change how we tackle climate change? I mean, what we have with the Copernicus system, we have just talked about the Sentinel missions. They are um, a unique set of different satellites. Uh, we have a number of them up there. Uh, and with all of them, we are taking the pulse of our planet, literally, that we look at all the elements, uh, the oceans, the atmosphere, the land surface, and how this Earth system works together. And we do need uh, these observations to really understand our planet, uh, to help agriculture, forestry, ship routing, farmers, uh, uh, disaster management people, so really for their daily life and for the job and the information they need. But also, um, we really understand climate change because we have these satellites measuring it. Let me just say that uh, Copernicus is really quite a, a unique uh, piece of, uh, of, of satellites and information we provide. Actually, uh, some colleagues uh, in the US, for example, call it the gold standard of, uh, of Earth observation. That means Europe has created, in the last 20 years, uh, one of the best, if not the best, Earth observation systems worldwide. Uh, and even NASA is participating in this program. And that's quite unique, because normally uh, we are the small partner of a NASA program. In this case, uh, it is fair to say that Europe has really established itself as a, as a major player, as a leader in observing our planet. And of course, of course climate change, sustainability, all these are key topics uh, which we address from space. And yes, uh, uh, this program really helps us understanding our own planet. And just a little bit more on that, when it comes to trying to understand where climate change is going as a forecast, what are you gauging from this at the moment in terms of your research? I mean, what we see, and we've just heard very recently that methane emissions are increasing drastically, uh, much higher than what we expected. Of course, we all know about CO2 as uh, being the main uh, greenhouse gas that is creating uh, the warming of our planet. Of course, we aim at 1.5 degrees by the end of uh, this century. Uh, it is a very tough goal, and we can only reach it if we are um, taking serious measures. Uh, so one thing is, of course, to get the measurements uh, with uh, satellites and on ground systems and uh, uh, air-based uh, information. But a much more important task is to convert this into information. And what we are creating there is, I call it, digital twin of our planet. So a digital twin, which allows us to 
model to simulate our planet and have what-if scenarios. So what happens if I change one parameter against, against another one? Uh, for example, in the energy crisis, now we are converting our coal and uh, oil uh, supplies into electric energy or more renewable energy sources. And of course, you can simulate what, that, what does it mean in order to be really faster in uh, meeting your carbon uh, targets, uh, which uh, we, we all have set uh, very ambitiously. So this uh, simulation allows us to really make sure, first of all, that we understand the system, but also make the right decisions in order to do the right steps and the right measures to get there in terms of reducing the carbon footprint and therefore minimize the impact of climate change. I imagine a lot of very interesting equipment will be used for this mission. Could you talk us through some of it? Oh yes, there is uh, a lot of it. I mean, we have uh, satellites that measure uh, that have radar sensors on board. A radar can look through the clouds. Uh, and measure day and night. So that means anytime, uh, whatever the daytime, whatever the weather is, you can take pictures down here on, on our planet. And that's quite amazing. That's, of course, very useful. But also, we have uh, sensors that allow us to measure sea level height with millimeter accuracy. So you can imagine a satellite flies in 800 kilometers uh, height and measures with one millimeter accuracy what is the average sea level height uh, on our surface uh, with radar altimeters which are on this satellite. So some of them are groundbreaking technology and science which we are applying and yes uh, this is quite a unique system and it's actually quite cool well, very cool and very interesting as well um, Alexandra I'd like to uh, end this with you you spent a year in space clearly got to see things that many of us haven't had the opportunity to do what's your perception of how we are dealing with earth right now well it's always you know hard <laughs> to look down on earth onto Earth from space and seeing things that we do down there. We see war from the outside. We see how people treat the planet. And at the same time, we see how fragile it is. And even more importantly, we see how alone we are. You know, uh, when we grow up down here on Earth, it looks uh, infinite. But if you see it from the outside, uh, on the backdrop of a black hostile cosmos, where there's nothing there, um, it's just from a few our, of our neighbor, neighbor rocks and planets, but apart from that, there's nothing there. If you see that and put it in perspective, it usually fills us, it did certainly with me and my colleagues uh, usually say the same, it fills us with uh, concern that uh, we're not treating our planet in the way we should to be sustainable, to make sure it's doing biosphere, it's doing what it's doing for us even in the future. And that's uh, something, that's a message that we uh, want to bring out. It's one of the most important things that we bring back as human, humans to fly to space as the perspective. But at the same time, uh, we're trying to make things better and to, you know, to uh, give scientists the data at hand that they need to understand this problem. Well, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to DW News. This is uh, Joseph Ashbacher, Director of the European Space Agency ESA, and uh, Alexander Gers, uh, the German astronaut. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much.